Okay. The number system. Oh, the assignments. Okay. Yeah. Uh, three. B. I got a different answer for three B, professor. Third question B. Um. All right. Let's look at it. Um. Let's see. Oh, let me share my screen too. I haven't done that yet. Um, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, Professor. So which one were you saying? Uh, 3B. 3B. Um, yeah, I should probably give out like a. A typo bounty or a uh, try let's see um 3b uh convert the binary to their decimal equivalent so so the um non-fractional part uh should be uh what one plus two plus 16 plus 32 that's 48 uh, 50, 51. Okay, so it should be 51.59375. Yes, professor. Okay, yeah. All right, so yeah, there's first mistake. So yeah, it should be 51. Why did I get 59? Because I thought the eight was there. One, two, four, eight. Yeah, yeah, 50, 51. I'll go ahead and fix that. Yeah, sure. Uh, to D, the question you gave was uh, triple one double zero professor, but here it looks different. To B? To D. Oh, D. Yes. Uh, no, uh, the top uh, next. To yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe I'm. I shouldn't have changed that, but yeah, maybe I, I had a slightly different. You're saying it was a different problem in the <laughs> assignment than the uh, one that I'd uh, had on the solution here. Let me see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I did mean that to be seven digits like the rest of those i i corrected that but i uh, forgot to do that there so so yeah without the extra zero this is what only uh 28 So uh, I'll make a note of that so I can correct those. I shouldn't try to add these up here right now. Uh, yeah, but if you guys spot any others that are mistakes, um, certainly it's good for me to know those because I might be reusing those. So. So let's see here. That's two uh, B and not two D and three uh, B. Yeah. All right. Um, other questions? Uh, I have a doubt regarding the formula for relative error, professor. Uh, in the denominator, uh, it should uh, whether it should be actual value or the the relative error for this is this is the other one then right yeah yeah other one uh, so computer arithmetic yeah so last one um, question if you look up relative error um, it um, it should be the value of um, the, um, the the measurement. Yeah, the measured value basically should be the denominator. 
basically that's because you're, you're, you're measuring the, the error of your calculation. So, so you wanna know the proportion of the error that you made compared to what the actual value was that you got. Um, so, so yeah, it should be the measured value on the bottom there. Okay, okay Professor. Thank you. That's, um, I mean, well, yeah, that, that's, that's important because, um, um, well, for one thing, you might not know what the absolute error is, right? So, so you, you'll know, uh, so, so unlike this problem, you might not always know uh, what your actual error is. So in order to estimate stuff, you have to do something in relation to what your actual value is. Uh, and then there's ways, if you ever take a course on a numerical analysis or something like that, there, there's ways to maybe put bounds on what the absolute error, what the maximum of the absolute error is, which can then give you some idea of your relative error, things like that. So. All right. Um, anybody else want to kind of jump in and ask about these? We, we can come back to these if, if, as more people come on. If, if they had some particular ones they wanted to look at too. Um, so there's probably a lot we can go over on the digital logic as well. Um, there is, you know, um, some practice problems for um, this chapter as well um, posted. Although I haven't um, posted the solutions yet on that. So like I noted in um, our most recent announcement um, or pretty recent announcement, uh, I'm probably just in, in terms of, you know, the, the schedule for these, since I kind of added these on recently, um, I'm thinking about, I'll probably be posting these just before our help sessions here on Wednesday for the week before. So that's why I posted the, um, the chapter nine and 10 on um, the number systems and uh, the computer arithmetic. So, um, and yeah, yeah, next Wednesday, I'll post the one for the stuff that we'll talk about today. Um, although it's good for me to have these as well before I talk about these, because kind of now that I know what the what some of these practice problems are, we can I can try and maybe do similar things. Um, when we talk about digital logic here, so. Oh, but but yeah, that reminds me, so I don't know, we'll see if anybody comes and asks specifically, but I'm, I was wondering if anybody had any problem with the Booth algorithm. Like I said, this makes a pretty good kind of um, example of a potential um, comprehensive exam problem, assuming that we gave you like the, um, the pseudocode or the flowchart uh, um, of, of the algorithm, so, but you know, you, you, we, we might assume that you know how to, what, what two's complement is and how to add and subtract two's complement numbers and things like that. So. Yeah, and hopefully I got all these right. I think I, think I kind of cheated a little bit on these. I did them by hand myself, but I also used that little computer program that I showed you guys to kind of confirm these after the fact. So I believe these are hopefully all right as well uh, in terms of the, um, the bit values that you should see for the IEEE 754 float formats. Um, okay, so, you know, as usual, feel free to jump in if people have questions. I think I'll go ahead and get kind of started on the digital logic here. Um, so to me, this is a very interesting chapter. Um, I, I mean, of course, you know, I mean, one reason why I'm an academic and, and uh, professor is that, you know, I can spend, you know, I had an idea. I spent hours kind of working on the, pro the, the um, solutions on this digital logic uh, chapter here. I haven't done this kind of stuff in a while, but um, but yeah, I personally did take one digital logic class as a student at one point. 
Um, and kind of as I mentioned in my notes here, I do encourage you, if you never did take a course in this, it, it's, it's really valuable, I think, for people in technology to actually think a little bit all the way down to this level. So this is where you can finally get there and connect up with the physics um, in terms of the integrated circuits and things. Well, kind of, a little bit, it's a little bit above that. But um, anyway, that, that was one reason why I had the, um, the Feynman book out here. I don't know if you guys can see that on my, uh, on my camera, but um, some book, kind of an interesting book that I like because um, Feynman's a physics guy, famous one, if, if you don't know him. Um, but uh, here he kind of connects up all the way down to the physics level of gates and integrated circuits up to computation. He has a lot of stuff like that we talk about in this chapter on, um, you know, um, um, Boolean algebra and the theory of computation and things like that, that, that connects up with digital logic and circuit design and, and things. So, um, so anyway, oh, and, and a couple of links for some courses. If, um, like I said, I mean, you know, if you don't have time to do it now, um, um, if you ever do have a little bit of time sometime, it's a good thing to maybe think about putting on your plate. Um, we have an undergraduate course um, that we teach it occasionally on, on digital logic um, that uh, our physics department used to be, used to do. So. But oh, to finish my thought on that, um, I think it's definitely worthwhile. I mean, kind of like, to me, I mean, a lot of, you know, I, I can say that about a lot of things, you know, so everybody should really know kind of the basics of things like data structures and um, um, algorithm analysis um, and, and, and programming, um, general kind of concepts of programming. Uh, if, if you're in the computer science field or uh, information technology, right? Um, but this is another one that, that's a good one to kind of have under your belt. It, it, it helps you understand lots of stuff like on the computer organization, organization level, like we're talking about in this course, uh, but all the way up then, you know, operating systems and things like that. So. Um, all right. So let, let's get into, uh, like I said, the, we, I, um, um, we'll see. I mean, there, there's certainly a lot of stuff in here that we could talk about. I'll have to pick and choose a few things. Um, so um, there's a small introduction to Boolean algebra, um, which I'll maybe go give the qu kind of quick summary of some of the important parts of this here. So uh, as it as as is discussed in our chapter here. Um, I mean, Boolean algebra definitely is uh, the, 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 the fundamental thing that's used in circuit design. So the fundamental uh, branch of mathematics, right? Because you can go directly from Boolean expressions, Boolean algebra expressions um, to through certain manipulations and processes it, to chip designs or at least logical chip designs. Um, I mean, you still have to sort of physically lay them out if you want to be an electrical engineer or, or an actual chip manufacturer, but um, you can at least get it down to, you know, these gates and you need these gates and these gates need to connect to those gates and things like that, you know, in, in sort of a, um, down to like a circuit diagram. Um, so, um, so this is a um, you know a branch of mathematics that's been around well before we had digital computers and, and digital circuits and integrated circuits. Um, uh, named after uh, Boole, um, was a mathematician in the 1800s, as our textbook mentions. So yeah, if, if you know if you didn't know about that, uh, you probably have heard about Boolean variables, uh, like in programming languages. Um, so those are these are simple. So Boolean algebra only uses Boolean variables as opposed to you know the more normal algebra that you're probably more used to, um, which uses variables that can hold number well real valued numbers basically. So the, the variables in Boolean algebra are always Boolean variables. So all Boolean variables have 
um, a value of true or false. Conventionally, we use one and zero um, for true, one, one for true and zero for false. Um, and that kind of makes sense. Uh, if you look at the basic um, operations of Boolean algebra and or not. So these form um, a complete set. That's another concept that's talked about in this chapter here, uh, or maybe, it, uh, sorry, in this section. Actually, I think in the, another, the, the third section coming up, they talk about the concept of complete sets here. Um, but yeah, the, the most basic kind of complete set is and or not. Uh, also, again, I'm, I'm, I assume most people are familiar with this if you've done programming, because besides doing arithmetical expressions, you know, addition and subtraction on numbers, um, you will do a lot of expressions on um, uh, conditional expressions on Boolean expressions using operators like and, or, and, and not. So most programming language will, will support those. Um, and, and maybe some others sometimes, so like exclusive or, or some other things. Um, so, I mean, one reason why zero and one is a good convention is because um, these symbols that denote the and operation, a dot, and actually multiplication, so that can be used for multiplication for real numbers as well, um, and as a symbol for multiplication in, in algebra. Um, and, and or can be denoted as a plus sign, like addition. Um, there's no real kind of, well, the, the, the not of, of a number is kind of like taking the complement of, of a real valued number. Um, but, um, but, but, but yeah, I mean, that leads to the idea of a simple truth table. So, so to see how these operations work, so let's start with not. So hopefully everybody um, knows what we mean when you take the, the, the logical not of a Boolean variable. So if it's true, like P, then, then it becomes false when, when you take its not or its complement um, and vice versa. So or and and or, um, I, I would assume, again, most students um, have run across these kinds of operations when we're doing conditional statements or Boolean um, statements. So the, and the or is kind of like plus or addition. So, so if you think of this as like adding up these values, um, you know, so zero plus zero is, is zero or zero or zero gives you zero. Um, so for the or, if any or both values are true, you get a one. And so it's not exactly like plus because uh, um, the plus for, for, for numbers, this is actually one with a carry of one, right? But um, but kind of similar idea. And that's, that's why the symbols have this correspondence. You know, same for multiplication. So in our truth table, um, zero and zero. So false and false is false. So the only, only time and is true is if both P and Q are true. So that, that's what and means. Uh, oh, there it is. That's what and means. All right. And again, you know, also kind of like multiplication, if you think of multiplying those for actual numbers, uh, we get the same result here in this case for multiplication. Um, and then from that, um, I didn't include like these um, identities and um, postulates. If you remember all the way back to taking in your algebra class at some point before college, maybe even before high school, um, you, at one point learned the, 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 the postulates and the identities for doing transformations of algebra. Um, I find a lot of people kind of the, the, the transformations, the, the mechanical process tends to stick with people and you kind of forget what they mean. Yeah? And, that, and that can happen uh, the same way for, you know, once you learn sort of transformations of Boolean expressions. Um, but if you think about these, um, at, at the beginning, um, you can kind of prove all these to yourself. Um, so, you know, and, and a lot of these are similar to, you know, basic algebra, algebra of numbers. So, you know, you can, there's commutative, you can, the, the, these properties are commutative um, they're, and they're distributive. So A times 
B or C is equal to A time A and B or A and C, right? You get a similar distributive property on, on regular algebra um, and so on with these identities. So uh, the, the, the and of some value with one is, is of course going to be one or going to be the value, right? So if the original value is zero, the and of zero and one um, is zero. And if the original value is one, the and of one and one gives you one. Um, so um, there's one thing um, in in most of the well, I mean in 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 the, the mathematical subbranch of Boolean algebra, uh, it's always assumed that um, and takes precedence over or. Um, so that that's um, kind of one of the um, the the, or, the 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 order of precedence. That's another thing that you might have learned remember learning from algebra, the the PEMDAS or that kind of thing. Um, parentheses, you know, evaluate parentheses have the highest order of precedence, followed by other things, uh, followed by multiplication, and division, usually, and, and addition, and subtraction, and things like that. Um, so. If you're looking at mathematical expressions of, of Boolean expressions, Boolean algebra expressions, um, parentheses still have the highest precedence, but followed by and, and then followed by um, or, right? Um, And then one final thing from this, um, there's another kind of common operator, the exclusive or, um, actually there's a couple of, of operators defined here in this table, um, and we'll talk maybe more about, I mean, NAND is really just the, the not of the AND, so, um, so, you, so you can kind of get this notation, but you can kind of understand that, or, or, or you should, you know, so if you take the, just the not of the AND result, that's what a NAND is. Um, and if you take the the not of the of the basic or operation, um, that's your basic norm. Now, exclusive or um, takes a little bit more work to derive this, but but you can um, um, create exclusive or, which you know was talked about in our textbook from um, and and or and and not. Um, um, but the and and uh, I can't remember if I talk about it here. I know our textbook talks a little bit about that. Uh, but um, exclusive, the exclusive or operation is um, another relatively common one, useful one. So in in English, you can think of that as should should be true only if one of the two values is true. Otherwise, uh, if, if both of them are false or both of them are true, then the exclusive or should be false. Um, but if only one, if and only if one of the two values is true, are you true for exclusive or? So. All right, questions on that so far? So if you guys get into the practice problems that I gave for this chapter, um, um, there's a lot of opportunity to, um, oh, I, I skipped over De Morgan's, I should mention that to you, but, but there's a lot of opportunity to, to practice applying these transformations in order to try and simplify Boolean expressions and things uh, in the um, example problems that I gave here. So um, um, oh, De Morgan's theory is um, also important. So, so we should mention that the um, um, taking the the NAND uh, of of two values um, is equivalent to the the not of the value or the not of the other value. Okay. So so, so if you have if you have a NAND. Uh, you can rewrite that as a as a as the or of the not of those individual products. Okay. Likewise, you can transform the the nor into the not of the and of, of, into the and of the complement of those individual um, 
Boolean variables. Um, Oh, here is, um, I mean, real quickly, an, exa an example of implementing the exclusive or um, using the, the, the three fundamental um, and or and not. So exclusive or, um, you can write that as a Boolean expression of P and not Q plus um, uh, P and, and not Q or P, not P and Q, right? So this will only be true uh, for the values where you, where, where where P is, is true and Q is not true. So, so that only matches, so that's only true for this particular uh, row of our truth table or this particular input of the P and Q Boolean variables. Um, and this one is only true when, when P is false and Q is true, right? And then, so the or of that would give you, would be true when either this one or that one, which is the ex exclusive or. Um, okay, let's move on. So um, the reason why Boolean algebra is important for circuit design, um, so for creating uh, electronic circuits and digital circuits, well, digital circuits particularly, there, there are different kinds of electronic circuits. So um, um, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, well, but but here we're mostly concerned with types of circuits that are using gates, um, which are um, which are fundamental building blocks, but, but basically you can create electronic circuits that have components that implement these logical operations, all right? Uh, and or and not, or others, uh, not NAND nor an exclusive or, right? Um, and because you can create circuits that operate as if they're doing these Boolean operations, that's why we can use the mathematics of Boolean algebra to design digital, digital logic circuits. Um, and, and the reason why it's important, you know, to have the, 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 the mathematics of Boolean algebra is important is because we can express Boolean expressions in this notation um, and we can transform them, we can simplify them um, in various ways. And, and, and there are algorithms to, to simplify complex Boolean expressions into their simplest form, which allows us to take um, a specification of a complex Boolean function and simplify it to its, its most simplest form, which allows us to build cheaper circuits, the most simplest version of the, our electronic digital circuit to implement that original Boolean function. Um, so yeah, the, the basic symbols and, and, and these are uh, kind of logical symbol designs for, for logical gates. Um, but yeah, you can kind of go from a circuit design like this to uh, actual chip manufacturing then if, if you can get this laid out um, in such a way on, on the space of your um, chip, your integrated circuit. Um, um, so basically, each gate has uh, one or, or more inputs. Um, so actually, the, the NOT gate is a little bit different from these others. The NOT gate can only ever really work on a single input. Um, all, all these gates have kind of a single output, so they, they compute their function and or um, NAND, NOR, or NOT, whatever. Um, so they compute their function and give a single output for the most part. Um, most of these other gates besides not can actually take two or more inputs. Okay, so, so the way that the physics works um, or, or the way that these things work is that, um, uh, that you can route multiple 
uh, two or more inputs. They, they don't really make sense for just one input, um, like, like not. So you have to have at least two inputs, but, but you can have three or more um, um, for these, right? So there's some things that we won't get into a lot in this class, you know, things like signal propagation delay. I mean, that has some, um, um, that, that gives some constraints when you're trying to design the, these kinds of digital circuits on a integrated chip. Um, so you have to worry about, you know, how long your paths are um, so that um, um, you're, changes when you change inputs that your outputs are, are there fast enough in order to be used in your computation. So, um, so when, when we're working with when electric electronic engineers are working with gates that they, they, they you know, kind of have their own um, terminology. So they'll usually talk about asserting a line. Um, so that, that's basically causing the line to, to, to go to one. Okay, so, so, so these connections between gates, um, uh, we can think of those as lines, uh, these connections here. They, they carry electronic signals. Uh, basically the signals are gonna be some voltage level. Um, so, so we use, Two voltage levels, a high voltage and a low voltage. Okay, most circuits use the, the higher voltage of the two. Um, that, that we, we interpret that as as the line being inserted or being true, um, and then the lower voltage would be uh, representing that that the computation or the line is false. Right. Sometimes that's flipped, I guess. Um, so sometimes low can be true and high false. So. So it, it does it does depend on on how you set it up and interpret that. Um, okay. Oh, this this was the section where function complete sets of gates were talked about. Um, so. Kind of by definition, and or and not are a function complete set. Uh, but you can find out that there are other sets that are functionally complete. So our textbook talks a little bit about uh, how why and and not is functionally complete. Um, I mean, uh, so the thing that's missing. So, so to prove one of these is functionally complete, you have to show that you can implement all of the three sort of fundamental um, functionally complete sets just using the, the, the gates and in, in the, the this other these other functionally complete sets. Okay. So for and and not, the one that's missing is or. Um, and we can implement an or. Um, so so we kind of give this to you. Um, so, so here, this circuit is only implemented using nots and ands. Okay, so, so, so we just um, we just assert here that that this is an implementation of the OR function, right? Uh, but, but uh, one way we can prove this is, is we can. This is our first example that I'm talking about of um, using um, using the I'm sorry using the um, um, identities to th th that were given here, like in this table 11.2, to manipulate our algebra, our, our Boolean expression um, to to show equivalent expressions. Okay, so in this case, to to, to use our identities to to show that that our original um, circuit here, well, our original Boolean expression um, is equivalent to um, an OR operation, all right? So, so to do this, we have to apply De Morgan's theorem. So here, the, the not over all of these um, is basically saying the not of the two, uh, of the, 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 the two expressions here, right? This is equivalent, um, like we had here, to, to, the, to 
the knot of whatever is under A or the knot of whatever is under B, right? But um, 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 in, this, in this expression here, though, um, A and B are already knots, so it's the knot of the knot, right? If that makes sense. Um, which um, we didn't have, I guess you, we could have added that as another identity. So, you know, if, if you take some value and you complement it, so if the value is true and you complement it, it becomes false. Um, and then if you complement it again, it goes back to the original value, right? So, so the knot of the knot is really just the original value. And the knot of the, the knot for this one, likewise, the original value. So anyway, so applying uh, De Morgan's theorem of the knot of, of A and B, and then applying this other identity that uh, I guess we could add to our table here, uh, the knot of the knot is the original value. You end up with the expression A plus B, right? So, so this is showing that um, um, this expression is equivalent to A or B. And that proves that um, a and not is also a function of complete set because you can use just and and not to um, to implement the or function, right? So, so this little circuit here is actually an or, okay? And if you don't believe that from the um, manipulation of the Boolean expression, you can always do, do a truth table. Um, so, so that might uh, prove it to you, uh, might, might be a better proof for you if you're not comfortable with doing these sorts of um, manipulations of the Boolean algebra, right? So um, our truth table here, like I said in the example um, problems, um, You have a lot of other opportunities to practice with these if you want to, uh, with, with more complicated things than this example. But, but here, um, we could build a truth table. So, so you always start out with a truth table with your inputs. So, so we've got A and B. Um, and, and since these are binary values, whatever, whatever number of inputs have um, is going to specify the number of rows in your truth table, right? So it's going to be two to the power of the number of variables that you have. So since we have two variables, we've got four possible input combinations for our truth table, right? Always. If we have three variables, we have eight possible combinations of inputs, right? And here in this case, most likely what I would do is um, I would start with sub expressions. Um, we might not need all of these, you know, but, but to be explicit, uh, we can create our two truth table um, and we can, we can get the, the, so recall that our expression originally was the, the, the NAND of not AND and not B here, right? So, um, so we can find out what not A and not B are. Um, by applying those, so, so the knot of A is going to be one zero one zero. The knot of B would be zero one. And, oh, and as usual, if I make a mistake, call it out. Um, it always makes so I don't know why I did my truth. I don't know why I did my inputs like that. So so conventionally we we, we do we number them consecutively zero 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 one one zero one one. There we go. So let me do that again. So, um, so, so if I order that the normal way that we would, um, uh, the knot of our A would look like that in our resulting truth table and the knot of our B would be um, like that, right? Um, And then we can apply the AND operation of the not A and the not B. So, so here we're not doing the, 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 the NAND yet. We're just doing the, the AND. And then we'll do the, the, the NAND of that. So, so the NAND, like if we call this, see, or, or to relate this to my circuit diagram, which I'll come back to, um, I, and that's actually what I did on the diagram. So, so I, I 
we, we calculated the AND of the not A and not B, and we labeled that as C as the output from the AND gate. So, so then we can calculate the not of our C here. So anyway, the, 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 the AND of that is going to be um, one and one is one, and the rest of these will be um, zero. So, um, so then finally, um, if we do um, the, the not of that sub expression, um, we get uh, this result. Okay. And, um, and then, yeah, finally, you know, right. So, what we're trying to prove, I mean, that. Is equivalent to the OR operation. You know, um, only we're only false if both A and B are false, but but if either A or B is true, um, then our result um, is true there, right? So anyway, that that's a, a, a simple example of the truth table, um, or at least how you construct one for um, a logical expression here. So, so your truth table always has your inputs. You start with the inputs, um, and then you construct your, uh, you know, it, I mean, some of these steps I could have maybe skipped, you know, if, if, if um, um, as, as kind of relatively obvious. So, so we, we can, like, like, I could have maybe skipped over these and directly went to the, the, the and of the not A and not B. Um, But in any case, so, so back to the circuit here. Um, so given that we've got our expression, which is the or um, um, this. You know, so, so one thing we've proved is that and and not by themselves are a functionally complete set. Um, and the other thing is that we've, we've, we've proven basically that this circuit, if you feed in A and B, the output at what I labeled C, not C here uh, will be the or of A and B, right? But but notice we're only using and not gates, right? So so we start by by you know using the the a not gate to give us the not of A and a not gate to give us the not of the B input. We we and those together to get the, the and of, of not A and not B. That's our C result. And then we not that again to get the NAND basically. Although this could have also been drawn, so, so uh, a convention is so, so NAND gates are constructible um, as sort of basic gates in circuits. Um, so electrical engineers like to use NAND and NOR gates. Um, that I'll I'll mention why here in, in, a, in a second. Um, but um, so yeah, I could have replaced these two symbols as as the symbol, the single symbol of, of a NAND gate. So you could do, maybe I'll leave this as an exercise to you guys, but you, you, could, you could figure out a similar way to prove that or and not are um, functionally complete, right? That's a relatively simple one. I think our textbook does walk through, uh, yeah, so it gives um, an example then of, of a, a proof of why NAND is functionally complete. So it shows circuits for computing uh, just from NAND gates, so NAND is the not AND, uh, the, the, the not, the AND, um, and the OR, right? So if you just have NAND gates, um, I can do the complement by just taking A for both the inputs, and I'll get the complement if I take that into a NAND gate, um, and so on. Right? <laughs> So one reason why functionally complete sets are important, uh, especially like the NAND and NOR functionally complete set, is that um, you, many chip manufacturing processes, uh, the, the cost can be greatly reduced if 
you only have to manufacture the chip using one type of gate, right? So um, it turns out, I mean, so, so if you manufacture all of your logic just using NANDs, or just using NORs, uh, so, I mean, for, for one thing, I mean, if you have to convert like all your AND operations to this circuit, I mean, you, you've changed one gate into two gates, right? So, so in, in, in one sense, you won't have the minimal amount of gates that you could have if, you, if you're using AND or a NOT as your function to complete. But the, 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 the increase in the number of gates tends to be far outweighed by the decrease in the manufacturing process from being able to use exclusively just one type of gate for everything on your chip, okay? Um, so almost all integrated circuit chips, when you get down to them at the logic gate level, are going to be all NANs or all, all NORs. Um, we ran across that once before when we were talking about flash memory. So, so one type of flash memory, I think, was using NORs or something like that. So, um, but that's that's basically um, um, why here. It has to do with these functionally complete sets. Um, oh yeah, so I did actually did that. Didn't leave it as an exercise to you guys. So, um, all right. So let's see questions on that so far. All right. Um, So yeah, let's go on. So as usual, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about uh, when to take a good time to take the break. Um, I think I'll do a little bit more. We'll just stop in the middle where wherever combinational circuits here. So we'll continue on to about 820 here for another 10 minutes. Um, so starting with our next two sections here, um, we get into some of the details of, of, of some of the different kinds of gates. Uh, well, actually, uh, all, all the things we're talking about here in the combinational circuits and the sequential circuits, um, uh, these are really groups of gates um, that form a, a functionally complete unit. Okay, so all, all these are very common sort of higher level units, which are a collection of multiple number of the gates that we've been talking about so far. So multiplexers, decoders, um, adders, flip flops, registers, and counters. Okay. Um, so um, I think I'm I'm skipping a little bit ahead here, but if there's one thing that you, you kind of remember about combinational circuits versus sequential circuits, um, it, it should be this, is that the, the, the difference is, is that combinational circuits are um, stateless. So for a combinational circuit, the output is only a function of the input, all right? So it doesn't doesn't remember anything. So 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 to, to, to figure out what the output is going to be, all you have to know is what the current inputs are, and it's going to do a transformation. So that, and that's basically so so all of the logic gates that we talked about so far are um, um, basic combinational in that sense. They they have no memory. They don't remember what any past input is. Um, their output changes immediately or after a slight gate delay. Um, upon a change of the input, um, you know, the, the voltage levels on the input, right? Um, and these combinational circuits work that same way, that their output changes only as a function of the input after some minimal gate delay. Um, so sequential circuits have memory, as, as I imply here. So, so the, the, the big thing about this is, is that 
their output depends not only on the inputs, but what their current state is or the history is of, of the inputs, right? So sequential circuits basically um, are what you need to implement memory, right? So, so sequential circuits, especially flip-flops, are the basis of all uh, memory, um, um, like flash memory and random access memory. I, actually, all memory except for read-only memory, okay? So again, I'm, I'm, I know I'm skipping ahead here a little bit, but um, uh, read-only memory um, is an exception because, um, I mean, it, it um, um, for a read-only memory, you, you, you don't have to read and write the values, right? So you don't have to change what's stored in there. So again, for read-only types of memory, um, it can be stateless. All you have to do is, is somehow manufacture it so it, it has stored um, a bit one or zero, but after that, um, it, 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 its output is always, doesn't even depend on the input. Its output is always gonna be just whatever stored in it. Um, um, all right. But, but, but before we get to talking about those different types here, um, this allows us to talk a little bit more about some of the process of designing chips. So, so some of the process of going from um, a Boolean expression, or actually usually we kind of start with a truth table or some idea of a big truth table for a circuit. Uh, and then we might use different um, ways to um, um, manipulate our representation to try and simplify that to its its simplest form. Um, okay, so anyway, as, as with gates, I mean, we can use truth tables or graphical symbols, so, so the, the, the symbols for circuits, um, or Boolean expressions to represent um, a combinational circuit, okay? Um, that's not quite true with the sequential circuits anymore because, um, again, because they have some memory, so we can't, completely represent the functioning of a sequential circuit with just um, a truth table. Um, we have to use a, um, um, like a sequence table, um, like they call it. Um, So uh, anyway, that, that introduces us to this idea of the sum of products or the product of sums. So uh, any Boolean function um, that we can represent in any of these three ways uh, can always be represented as a, as a Boolean function from a truth table by expressing it as the sum of the products, that's the SOP, or, as, or by expressing it as the product um, of the sums. Um, the, the POS here. Um, so, why would we do this? Well, um, the, um, but the, the, the sum of products is a little bit easier, so we'll start with that. Um, but basically, I mean, you can always, the, the, we express things like this because there are known ways to take this representation um, and then manipulate that. Like, for example, using uh, the, the, the Boolean algebra identities as one way to, to manipulate that into simplified expressions of, of your original Boolean expression. Okay? And you can, and, and there's an easy way to take the kind of the most basic representation, a truth table, and represent that as either of these, the sum of products or the product of sums, right? Um, so let's let's redo this example. So, so the first one is an example of the sum of products. So we've got a truth table that defines uh, a circuit. Um, a circuit of, of that will need multiple gates to implement, right? So the, from the truth table, you know, we get all these relationships that um, um, F should be false when A, B, and C are zero, and, and false when A and B are zero and C is one, 
um, and so on. Okay, so from this, uh, we can represent this as the sum of the products. Okay, so the idea for the sum of the products is that um, basically one way to represent that is that we want f to be true um, either when um, this combination is, is true. So, so f should be true. Um, Um, so yeah, so 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 basically to go, to go back to the sum of products here, um, yeah. If we have the um, the knot of of a, so so looking at these, look at looking at each one of the rows where our output needs to be one, okay? So then we want to add, we, we want to create expressions for each one of these. Um, so, oh, uh, yeah, the reason I'm getting confused, confused myself, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong one. I keep looking at the sum of products. So, so, so the, the, the first one, the, the product of sums, uh, sorry, the, the, the first one, the, the sum of products um, is actually this expression here, which is a little bit easier to understand. Uh, sorry, um, um, I was confusing myself here. So, so, so this one's relatively straightforward compared to the sum of products. So basically, uh, we, we want F to be true when any of these, uh, when I, if this row is true, if we have this row or we have this row or we have this row. So there's only three here where F is true. So this one, this one, or this one, this or this or this, if either of those are the row that we're looking at, um, F should be true, right? And then we can write an expression that's true only for each one of these rows by, you know, um, so for this one, uh, we have an expression that's only true uh, when um, A is false, B is true, and C is false. So that's not true for any other row. Right, so not A, B, not C. Right, and that's our first one. So if that one is true, or the next one is not A, B, C. So if that's true, or if um, A, B, not C. Right. So so if that row or that row or that row, then that means um, F should be true by our truth table. Um, So, oh, uh, anyway, yeah, so they didn't, I, I was um, wondering, I was thinking if, if they tried to simplify uh, these or not. Um, but yeah, in any case, this circuit here, they didn't, didn't do any simplification. So this example for the sum of products is just directly Looking at that, so, so um, uh, the, the point of this here is, is um, to emphasize this idea that we can always go from the truth table to a circuit, okay? So this might not be the simplest circuit, but this circuit will um, implement um, this truth table because it's directly implementing our um, um, sum of, of the products form here. Um, Our, our, our um, SOP form here. Um, so, don't, and, and you know, you should probably convince yourself of that, you know, so um, um, a pretty standard kind of layout for a simple circuit, you know, we've got three inputs and we also have the not available of all these. Um, so our three terms here uh, get implemented by these three um, and, 
gates. Um, and so this is a convention that we haven't seen before. So this represents a connection. So lines going over each other um, are not actually electrically connected um, unless there's the, um, the, the period at that point um, where they cross and they connect here. So this, this AND gate here is only getting the knot of A and then B and then the knot of C. So that was the first one of our um, um, sum of products here um, and so on. And if we take the result of these three ANDs and we OR them together, we get our final results. Right? Um, So the product of sums um, that is similar, it's a little bit more complicated. So this is the way to think of the product of sums. So, so, so use the kind of same process or similar process. You start in this case though, with, with the places where F is false. So we got more of these on here, right? So, so at face value, you might want to use the, um, the method where you have the least number of terms that you have to do. So since we only have three ones, um, but five zeros, uh, that, that might mean that you want to use the um, sum of products. Uh, but you can do the product of sums. Um, but to do this, what you want to do is, um, so like looking at this first line, um, you're basically saying that um, you want to be true any time it's a row that um, where, where the output is false. Okay, so for any, so, so you, you, you find all the rows where the output is false. So that, that's going to be not A, not B, not C um, for our first one. And, uh, you know, uh, not A, not B, um, but but C for the second one and so on. So, so we've got five of those, okay? So for those, though, so, so these would be true only when these rows are true, but what you want, so the, the reason why we not the whole thing, so we're doing a, a, a NAND here. So to get F to be one, where our truth table says, we need it to be not this one and, so it needs to be not this one and not this one and not this row and not this row and not that row, okay? So that's, that, that's where, why we're taking the, 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 the not of these ands here, right? Um, but the, 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 the product of sums is usually not written this way because, so, so no, I mean, this is the, 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 the product of, the, of, the, of nands, or product of products, basically. Or basically here. So, so we, we, but we can apply De Morgan's theorem, um, Which, which we already showed using the truth table, um, I think, um, is, is, is an actual valid relationship. So, so we can um, transform all of these into, from NANDs into just the sum of, of, or, of, into ORs, right? So that's where the sums come from. But anyway, if you transform all of these, you get the, the um, sum of products forms. So, so this is just the same, sum of products form um, that, that we had here uh, after we transformed using De Morgan's theorem, right? Um, and yeah, they just rewrote it, right? So, so they, they, they rewrote it so that we have the, the simplest term, the one with the least number of complements first, but we still have the five terms again, um, one for each row. And although now uh, one thing that, the, another thing that makes the um, product of sums a little bit harder um, as well to go back to is, is that once you apply De Morgan's theorem, um, these are the inverse, right? So, so, you know, if you want to go back to find the five rows, you have to remember that you have to take the complement of these. So this was originally the, the, um, um, uh, the first row where all of the values are zero. So. All right, and, and then like uh, we showed for this circuit, um, uh, again, we, we didn't show simplifying this at all, so there, there might be simpler circuits if we did some simplification 
on these, which we talk about next year. Um, but um, um, uh, anytime you have a product with sums, you can always create a circuit um, that's just a, um, um, in this case, a bunch of OR gates first that can operate in parallel on your inputs, followed by combining all those into a final AND to get your final result uh, F here. Okay, and then finally, um, although um, at this point, then we can start talking about actual simplifications, all right? So there's, there's three ways, um, and I think I'm, I'll take a break and we'll come back to these um, and, and I'll show these here. Uh, but but there's, there's three basic ways that you can kind of do simplification or that our book covers, there, 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 there are probably more. Um, so you can always take your um, Boolean expression and use um, Boolean algebraic simplifications by applying the identities um, and the other transformations that we might have, right? So, so um, um, these kinds of transformations of, of the Boolean expression. That can be difficult. Um, but it's always possible to do that even by hand. Um, although the other thing is that there are um, algorithm, algorithmic, you know, there are, are um, computer, um, so, so you, you can make this into an algorithm so the computer can do these sorts of simplifications, right? Um, or you can use this representation called Carnot maps. This are, these are probably mostly used for educational purposes, so for electro electronical engineers um, taking EE classes and things might use Carnot maps a lot, right? They have a big limitation that you really can't use these if you have more than four input variables, so it's, it's somewhat limited. Uh, but for your, um, you know, your, your practice questions that I gave you, these might be very useful, especially for one problem, um, because uh, it can be really hard if you have a big Boolean expression to see uh, a way to simplify it, um, but but then it, but it'll be quick or, or almost relatively straightforward to see how to simplify it using one of these Carnot maps. Okay, um, and then finally, um, there's this. Quinn Mikulski method. Um, I'm sure there's other methods, but this is another example of an algorithmic method um, that you can use. Um, and I probably won't go over this today. Um, I'll let you read that. Um, but um, probably the th this would be fun for a programming assignment, I think. Uh, but um, probably the main thing to understand about this one is that um, um, that yeah, you can develop computer algorithms that can go from a truth table like of inputs to outputs and um, algorithmically find the, the simplest form that that's there in your um, expression or in your truth table. So if you, if you walk through this example, that's, that they show that um, how this Quine, Quine Klusky method um, algorithmically transform the expression into, into a simpler expression, presumably the simplest expression for the um, um, for, for this complex um, truth table that we had here. So this, this one's similar to the practice problem of the um, um, of the uh, the the um, the LED display one that I gave that that um, um, that I'll post the solution of later on here. So, um, all right. So I'll come back uh, and talk a little bit more about the details of actually probably the Carnell map. So we've already talked about kind of the algebraic simplification and, and showed um, a little bit of an example of it. I might do one more of those here in relationship to the the Carnell map here. 
Uh, but let's take a, a five minute break. So it's a little bit past 8.30. So we'll come back at about 8.37 or 8.38 here um, and uh, finish up with stuff. So, okay. Okay, um, let's go ahead and start again if everybody's ready. Um, so, now that I'm thinking about it, I'm, I'm probably just going to um, um, talk a little bit more about Carmel Map here, although while I'm doing these, um, um, I can probably, I, I think, thinking about this, um, we can um, uh, give maybe an example then of doing the uh, some algebraic manipulation. Uh, although we'll see if I can, if we can get it, if I can get it right here on the fly or not. Um, so, so so let's let's look at these. Um, so so all this section we're concerned about trying to simplify the circuit, um, and you know that's an important thing to be able to do. So um, for many reasons. So so often. You know, it, it, so we all, whenever you take a, a class like this, I mean, and, and you need to do these kinds of things by hand in order to understand the principles, you can usually only at, at most work with examples with four or, or five uh, inputs. Um, but, um, you know, for real circuits, you might have, hundreds of inputs and, and hundreds of outputs and, and you know you'll, it would get very complex um, if you're trying to manipulate um, boolean expressions or what or whatever by hand so, so you know that, that's why we need kind of algorithmic methods that we can use a computer to help us do these sorts of simplifications and, and, and reduce down the circuits to the smallest possible circuits that, that we can get um, Another point about um, just looking at this particular example that they used for uh, the more extended uh, Carnot map. Um, so um, what was this example? It was um, um, it, it was um, They, they must just describe it. So, so anyway, the, the inputs was mapping from um, regular binary coded decimals into this sort of packed decimal. Um, so the basic idea is that um, from any, in this other representation of, of the, you know, the magnitudes from zero to nine, uh, any, any increment from one to the next only changes one bit, okay? So this, this is a good representation if you want to use an counter because it, 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 if you're all if basically all you're doing is incrementing the um, the numbers until you wrap around or whatever your counter does, um, 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 it simplifies things only one bit ever changes at a time between one clock cycle and the next or whatever, whatever your whatever um, timing you're using to increment. So anyway, I mean that's not, that's not really important. Um, um, I mean, uh, one thing to note about this example, I mean, you can have multiple outputs uh, for an input. So our truth table here, basically, uh, there, there's four outputs, there's four inputs. Um, um, and, and we need to, if we want to create the circuit for this, we have to uh, have an output for all digits. So, so given the input of ABC, our output for um, Um, the, the WXYZ, as we label them, output should, should have these bit patterns, okay? Anyway, so, so what I was trying to work up to then is that if you want to do this using simplify these, you actually have to treat this as four separate circuits, you know? So, so you need to, 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 to write expressions or create Carnot maps for each of the outputs and then, and then simplify those, okay? Um, 
So if, if you look at it like that, then like, for example, we can just concentrate on one of these outputs. I won't talk about the others then, right? So, um, so given these inputs, um, we have these outputs for the most significant bit of our uh, pack decimal uh, representation here, right? So, you know, when inputs are, are these values, our output should be zero and, and so on, right? Um, another thing about this, uh, again, this is, you need this for the uh, practice problems that I gave, um, but um, sometimes not all possible inputs are relevant to your circuit, okay? So some of these inputs should be impossible because we're really representing decimal numbers um, in our pack decimal increment are here, right? So, so really only, we've really only got 10 numbers, um, zero through nine digits. So we really don't care. Um, uh, I mean, hopefully if we design our circuit correct, we should never end up with inputs that represent, you know, the, the number, uh, the, the, the decimal number 10 in binary or 11 or 12, right? So we can do that with, with Carl Mops, with with by using these to represent those when we're trying to simplify. Okay, another thing though that I want to point out for the practice problems that I, I don't think that they mentioned this in our textbook, um, but um, if you if you try to use out um, Boolean algebra simplification, you also have to. Um, You have to take into account these don't cares. So that means if, if I want to use a Boolean um, algebra, you know, using the identities, I have to not only list all the places where it says one, but I also have to, to list the places where it has don't care because it might turn out that um, I can make a simpler circuit if I allow these to become one um, for my simplification, okay? So, um, so let's, uh, I'm going to just recreate this and then I'm going to try to do the manipulation um, um, uh, for, for maybe just the W expression, okay? So, so you know, from our textbook, you can see that the simple, simple, simplest version of this um, logic of our logic table that we have here is, is this expression here. Um, and we can get this from the Carnot map, okay? So let's, let's see how they got that from the Carnot map real quickly. Um, so you start a Carnot map um, by um, you, you could put in the, all the ones and the zeros and the don't cares, but uh, like, like they show, it's um, probably easier to read if you only fill in the ones and also the Ds, though. Um, so there's, there's lots of simplifications that could happen uh, if you use the Ds uh, that you might not be able to, to use if you don't use those. Okay, so in this case for W, you can actually really make no simplifications. Um, if you don't use some of the, 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 the D lines here, okay? So anyway, what, what they have is, is a table and the maximum that you can kind of do, unless you try and do this using like a third or higher dimension is um, four input variables, okay? So that translates into a table, a four by four table. Um, Or, um, oh, you have to number these the, the, the correct way here. So in order for this to work. So like in that, in that order and, and the same thing, but um, like that, okay. So we're, really what these represent is uh, different combinations of the A, B and the C, D variable. So, um, like they showed in a previous figure, a simplified way of thinking about this is that um, these are where C is true. 
um, and, and these columns are the represent where the D is true. And then these columns represent where the A is true. Or sorry, rows, these rows are where A is true. And then these rows are where B is true here, okay? Um, and then the, the rows that I haven't indicated are where the, the complements are true here for these combinations, all right? So, um, so in general, the way to read this, so, so first you have to start off by filling in the table, right? Um, Um, so for W, we only had two locations where W needed to be true given the input. So one of these was when um, 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 A was false, but but B, C, D were true. Okay. So that actually, I should have also maybe written out the um, um, sum of products expression here. So so the simple sum of products expression for W is. Um, We only have two rows where we have one. Um, so it's where um, not A, um, B, C, D, um, or so it's that row, uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, <coughs> or the very next row, 1, 0, 0, 0. That's really all that you need for the sum of product um, expression for the truth table if we don't consider the don't cares at this point, right? Um, uh, but, but yeah, we can use that to help us here. So, so um, for this first one, we need uh, the row that represents not A, so, so where, where A is false, but B is true. So, so the, 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 the first one here are their A's. So the not A's are this, these two rows. Um, and, and where the B is true is um, is is this row. So so only this row is going to be where um, uh, not A. So, so these are the not A's. These two, uh, but B is true. And then the, for the column, then for for our first one here, we need the the columns where both C and D are true. So so the these two rightmost columns are where C is true. You know, so, so C is the first digit, one, one. So, uh, and then these two columns are where D is true. That, that's the second digit. But anyway, so, so if you do that, this square is the, is the one that represents of our 16 possible inputs where we have um, not A from here, but uh, B is true and C is true and D is true, right? And that's kind of why these can help you. So, so um, um, you can kind of directly use those to, to, to get the right square in the Carnot map. Okay. And then our other one is um, where A is true, um, but B is not true. So, so that has to be this row um, and where C is not true, so that has to be one of these two and where D is not true. So that gets you, I'm um, oh, sorry, not that one, that one. So, so D is not true on these two rows here, right? And, you know, like I was saying, if you don't take into account the don't cares, there's no simplifications that can be made. So that implies that this form here um, in um, the, the sum of products form is as simple as you can get. But if you fill in the don't care, so there's actually don't cares for um, all of the remaining uh, rows. So we have don't care for um, 1010, 1011. Um, one one zero zero, and again, if anybody sees me make a mistake while I'm doing these, um, uh, shout out. So that was one one zero zero, and I should have left myself more room. So, and then one one zero one, one one zero one. Oops. Uh, I probably should write the bit pattern under here to, to make it easier to look. 
and then one 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 zero, and then finally one 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 one. All right. So that that's that's the full um, sum of products expression where we put in the don't cares. Okay. Um, and then this table that the those um, those six don't cares for the 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 decimal digits ten through fifteen um, actually represent um, all the places where um, a is true. And I'm kind of leading up to the simplification that we can do here. So it's all the places where where a is true. Um, And then also as well, not quite where all A is true. There's two places where A is true in the first nine digits. Um, so where A is true, um, uh, anyway, so, so those, those are our uh, six Ds that represent the, the ones that I added on here, right, in, in our table here. So. so uh, for the Carnot map, um, and I'm just recreating what they show in the figure 1110 here for the W. Um, I mean, you, you, you want to find the biggest groups, um, and, and these groups can wrap around edges, so, so you have to kind of be careful. But in this case, we have no group of eight that I could circle. Um, I mean, almost. If I had something there, I would have a group of eight. Um, but we can circle a group of four that includes one of our one digit, which will help us in this problem here. So if we circle those, that represents um, um, if we write that in our expression, so, so what we're saying is, is that th this represents a possible simplification. Um, um, so if we, if we write the expression that represents the, the things we circled, uh, and then if we write you know, in the sum of products form, if we, if we write all the, the expressions that we need to circle all the ones. Um, so where the don't, the Ds don't concern us here is that if we don't end up with the Ds circled, that's fine. As long as we write down the expressions where we've circled um, um, all of our Ds, okay? So, um, and in fact, um, you can have, circles of, of eight, four, two, or one. So I don't know if, if uh, the, the book only circled the, the one here. Um, so I don't know if you get a simpler expression if you circle the, the two values like that. Let's try either way. Let's first do what the book did. So here for, for our first one though, um, these four that we've circled represent the places where A is true um, and D is not true. Um, and, and, and that's it, right? So when you have a group of four, you're actually eliminating two of the other variables. So the, the, the you know, so I got that again from, from the, the looking at this, um, the, the helping um, notation on the sides here. So, so, so the rows are, 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 are only where A is true, and then the, um, the, the columns are only where D is not true, right? So that, that gives you your expression here. So basically, this expression covers exactly those four squares here. So, so anything where it's true, where A is true and D is not true, um, would, would end up in those four locations, right? And then they showed just as if, as, as if A, B was circled once. So that would be... Um, um, uh, so, so yeah, if you have a, a standalone circle, that that would be here where um, um, A is not true, um, but B is true. So A not true, B is true, um, C is true, and uh, D is true. So not A, B, C, D. So let me rewrite that. I got this whole board here, so. So the simplification, and, and this is right from the book, is just the A not D for the group of four or with the, the, the single one, uh, which we can represent by not A, B, C, D, right? 
or I think um, there is actually a simpler form. Um, so um, I may be correct in the textbook here um, because if, if you do this group of two, we can eliminate one of the variables. So, so we should get the AD still, but um, um, here we still got, um, um, so, so here you can see that, that it's not A or not A, it's A or not A um, does not, so we have both A and not A. So that's the variable that gets eliminated. Uh, but otherwise we've got uh, the expression B, um, C and D. Right. So, um, I'll leave it as an exercise to, to do the truth table to prove your, your, to yourself. So if you, if you didn't, um, I mean, you know, it, it would be worth proving to yourself. Um, so, so uh, you know, to summarize the procedure so far from the Carnell map, we have, we have said that, that this expression here in particular um, can be implemented with exactly the same results as this expression if we don't care uh, for some of these, uh, values that we mark, whether they end up being zero or one, right? So if you wrote, if you wrote the truth table for this, you should find that all of the first nine, uh, we get the correct results, um, and then the other um, values through uh, of 10 through 15 um, could be zero or one, but, um, but that's fine as long as we get the correct results for the ones that we do care about, right? Um, Okay, and then finally back to, let, let's see if I can simplify this um, using kind of the identities of um, Boolean algebra real quickly then. So like I said, um, uh, you do need to write in the don't cares if you wanted to get the simplest form here. And we've got that complete thing here. I don't know if I've probably left myself enough room here for work, but, um, but uh, now that I kind of know what the simplest form is, that helps me a little bit. So I can find, I can maybe look for the simplification that removes um, the B and C um, to get the first term here, right? Um, so if you look at all the terms that have A and not D, um, not that one. So, so like this one here, yeah, I'll circle these, um, A and not D. Right, so 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 from these four terms, um, we got. I'll just do these right now. We've got the A, not B, not C, not D, um, or yeah, and I could just rearrange these. So that was one of our identities: is that um, uh, the commute the the commutative law. Um, And then I would have the rest of these that I didn't circle as well, um, arranged somehow uh, on my line here. Um, so I can probably, uh, so probably I'm just gonna really quickly kind of do these here. So um, again, you know, the, the grouping um, doesn't matter, um, well, um, so, so I, I could regroup these um, like this uh, because for my first two terms here, they have uh, A, not B, not D. So then we can use the, um, the distributive law to pull out the D, or to pull out the, the, uh, those terms. Um, because basically this is like um, 
A not B not C times uh, or, or anded with uh, D um, or not D, okay? So this is by the commutative law, or sorry, this is by the distributive law. Um, um, which, well, I'll, I'll let you read, I'll let you go back and refer to the table there, right? And the reason why you want to do something like that is because D or not D is an identity. So if, if you take something and or it with itself, uh, take something and or it with the complement of itself, this is always one, right? So that, that comes out to one, right? And, and basically that drops out. And then likewise, you know, so we do the same thing over here. Um, We've got the A, B, not D, with the uh, not C or C, right? So that simplifies down to that. Um, In the first term as well, we have to take D common process, D common. Um, say it again. Yeah, I see that I've made a mistake here somewhere. So were you pointing it out for me? In the first term, uh, A not B and not D should be taken as common. Um, right, thank you. Yeah, that, that was a mistake. That was the mistake I made. So, because yeah, we're trying to, to uh, keep A and not D, or, or we're going to end up, if we get back to this, keeping A, not D. Um, and yeah, eliminating. So, we're eliminating C. You're, you're right. From here. Um, and we're doing the same thing over here and eliminating C. Um, and then you can probably see then, so we can do the same thing. So, so now we end up with two expressions with three terms. Um, they both have A, not D in common. So now we can do the same kind of trick, um, A, not D, um, and, and eliminate the B. Um, and we end up with the A, not D, all right? Um, so yeah, I mean, Basically, then I should probably move on, but, but basically what we're doing here, um, I mean, it, it does help. So, you know, you can use um, an example from the kernel map. So, so we, were, we were identifying those commonalities using the Boolean expression um, and eliminating variables in, in steps here um, to get to the term here. So, and then presumably then the, the terms that I haven't dealt with, uh, we could do the same thing to eliminate um, 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 a here um, and end up with just B, C, D. So um, I, I, I'm not going to uh, um, show that, but, um, but um, it should be possible. So. Um, all right. Sorry, that was one of those. So you have to do the same thing for the other. So it would be good, good practice as well to, to confirm, you know, um, um, the expression that the book came up with for the X, Y, and, and Z uh, output as well here. So. All right. So yeah, let's move on. Um, so I don't have a whole lot more. Um, I'll, I'll probably just briefly go through then um, all these different kinds of circuits. Um, so, so we we were kind of we, we talked about kind of simplifying the circuits, and, and now you know it's good kind of have a, a general um, idea then of, of, of these different kinds of higher level kind of components that. 
our textbook talks about here. So, um, so a multiplexer is um, uh, allows you to use basically what looks kind of like an, an address, um, you know, or, or anyway, some number of control bits to allow only one output uh, among a set of them um, to, to, to go through the multiplexer, okay? So, um, so basically, if, if you have two input lines, you can think of that as like a two-bit address. Um, so the possible values would be 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Um, and then if it's 0, though, you're going to allow whatever the signal is on D0 to be the output. And if it's 1, it would be D1 and so on, right? So, so this, this is a relatively easy circuit to implement using um, ands, ors, and nots, right? So, so you can draw a circuit diagram for a, uh, a four to one multiplexer, okay? So, uh, you know, in modern chips, it'd be more uh, common to have bigger one, you know? So, so you might have like a 32 multiplexer if you have 32 bit addresses or something like that. So like I said, they give some examples. Uh, actually, uh, 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 translating addresses are, are uh, more use, more often kind of decoder sorts of things. So control signals, um, um, so their example, you know, the, the, the program counter, um, the, the way that you update the program counter in a, a typical uh, computer architecture, uh, that there's several, several ways it could be updated. Um, so the normal ways to increment it. So, so if we're doing a sequential execution of, of fetch execute cycles, um, every time after you fetch, you might normally increment the program counter, but the program counter can be um, changed uh, in other ways. So, so you might get it directly from a register if like, uh, uh, if you have a, a, like an unconditional branch instruction, or um, you might need to compute the um, instruction. So, so like you might have a, a, um, a branch with an offset where you have to compute the offset um, or you might have to first check a condition, like first check if something's true before you decide if you're going to use just the regular increment or you're going to use a branch, right? So all of those could represent sources of different ways that the next value of the program counter should um, be updated. Um, so a multiplexer might might do that. So, so depending on which one of these is the true uh, way that the program counter needs to be updated, that, that would end up being your, your um, control signal. Um, and then that would give you like an output line of, of, of which bit or which set of bits um, to put into the program counter. Um, anyway, so a decoder is kind of like the, the reverse idea. Um, so, so instead of having multiple inputs, it has multiple outputs, but only one of which output is asserted at any given time, All right? So, So I guess they didn't give a, a box diagram like they did for the, the multiplexer. Um, but, but yeah, basically it's gonna have the same two, the, the same kind of idea of some control signals um, as inputs, but then I'll have multiple lines coming out, right? Um, but, and, and it would only have one input. And then again, depending on those control signals, that input would go 
to the, the particular line uh, as, as an output here. So. so they gave an example for address decoding. Um, So that's, uh, I mean, this, this is basically an, an example where the, um, the output from the decoder is, is basically using as an enable signal, okay? So given the address, like, like if we have four, you know, as a real high level of what they're talking about here for the address encoding, um, if we wanted to have a kilobyte of RAM and, and, and um, we didn't have a single kilobyte chip that we could put onto our, Integrated circuit. We had to use four 256 um, byte chips here. So, so each one of these chips holds 256 um, eight bits of memory, right? Um, so basically, this case, this is kind of similar to the caching that we did. Um, so here, since we have um, Um, so, since our address needs 10 bits, um, we would use the high order bit to determine which of the four, the higher order two bits to determine which of our four actual chips we, we, we have memory on here. So, so basically, um, um, in order to address 1,024 possible addresses, so, so we've got one kilobyte or 1,024 memory addresses, uh, we would need 10 bit addresses. Uh, but the two high bits would select one of our um, small bits of memory, you know, one of our memory chips. And then the other, other um, eight bits, the, the, the lower order bits from bit seven down to bit zero, would be used as, as, um, as the offset to, to figure out which of the 256 um, bytes or we're trying to read or write out of the RAM here. So. All right, oh, that, that was kind of what I was looking for before. So. Um, although this is kind of more specific to the address decoder, but but basically, you know, you've got um, 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 in control bits for two to the n outputs, and you do have an input. So um, this input here represents if somewhere else, if we're trying to do a read or a write, then then that's going to be one. So that um, whichever um, um, of these outputs is selected, you'll end up with a one or a enable on there. Otherwise, if we're not currently trying to do a read or a write, this input would be zero, so you wouldn't enable any of these. Um, so, so the output would be zero for all of these, um, and, and these all would be disabled for reading or writing. Um, Okay, so um, I already mentioned for the, the read-only memory. Um, so um, again, like, like it says here real briefly, you can consider um, ROM read-only memory to be a, a type of commutational circuit. So for instance, you could implement it as a, as, as a decoder. Um, basically where the address um, always gives um, um, one particular value here. So what, whatever the value is that you've written into your ROM. Um, All right, and finally, adders on the computational circuits here. Um, so these are used extensively in computer architectures. There are lots of things that we need to do. So um, the, uh, I mean, all of the 
arithmetic that we talked about in the previous chapter on computer arithmetic, uh, uh, both addition, subtraction, and also multiplication um, and division as well. But, but all those were actually reduced down to additions, remember? So um, either additions of, of unsigned binary values or additions of um, of the uh, choose complement encoded by binary value, right? And for subtraction, we would just complement it um, or, or choose complement the value and then do an addition, right? For multiplication, multiplication was just really a sequence of additions or subtractions, where again, if we need to do a subtraction when we were doing choose bit, uh, so choose complement um, um, multiplication, uh, again, we, we take the, the two's complement and then just do an uh, addition again. Okay? So anyways, so all the computer arithmetic that we talked about, whether you, it, whether you realize it or not, um, um, all got reduced down to additions. Um, and all those can basically be implemented by um, um, using adder, common notational circuits, all right? Um, So yeah, I mean, th these, these, you can build up the idea yourself um, or visualize it from the description in this section. So you can start with a single si with a single bit adder. So something that takes two binary digits and adds them, right? So for a single bit adder, you, you have two inputs um, and you're actually gonna have two outputs because um, you can end up with, with some, but you also have to represent um, a carry, so so if, if the result doesn't fit into a single bit anymore, you have to also handle that carry. So then to create a four bit adder, all you have to do is, is put four of these single bit adders into sequence. So you add up the first two bits um, and you get the result, the, the output bit for the result. Then you send the carry plus the next plus the, the, the bits in the next significant digit, add those together, right? Um, so so yeah, one quite as simple. So 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 you really have to have three inputs for all these. So for your initial least significant bit, the, the input, the, the care the input for the carry would always be zero, right? Um, but you still only need two outputs, even if you think about this as adding the the three bits, the A, the B, and the carry bit. Um, um, but yeah, anyway, you can add those in sequence. Um, and if you put um, eight of those together, you can end up with an eight bit adder as maybe a, a single unit. Um, and then if you add, you know, put four of those in sequence, you can get up to your 32 bit adder, which would be what you would need for constructing the circuits for 32-bit um, addition of unsigned values and 32-bit addition of, of, of signed values, right? Remember, from, from the adder's point of view, you don't have to, you don't have to care about whether the, the, the values are represented as, si as signed 32-bit um, integers or as unsigned 32-bit integers. So as signed integers using um, Two's complement. Um, in both cases, you can just treat them as unsigned and use a, a, an adder, right? And you'll get the right result, whether it's encoded using two's complement or it's an um, unsigned representation. Um, so yeah, I Anyway, so one final kind of um, thing that's discussed in here about adders is that um, there is a, a problem with um, gate delay. Okay, so, so if you actually build these uh, as as a sequence, um, although you know they get, you know each one of these actually has multiple gates that you would need to, to, to implement the one bit adder, uh, but but every one of these along the sequence would have to wait for the carry bit. To settle down before um, its value, its value um, outputs would become valid, right? 
So, so while normally the date delays are, are pretty negligible, uh, if, if, you, if your series ends up being too long, you can end up having, make, making it too long for the computation um, to become available, right? And I talk a little bit about that in this section here. So, um, um, so you can uh, use this approach that they call it the, a, a look ahead carry, right? So you can basically take your inputs and calculate what the carry is going to be for the output from an, from an adder. So in that, in that way, if you do it, I don't think they showed a picture of this, but they did talk a little bit about how you can calculate what the carry would have to be. But if you do that, then you can feed the carry into, basically you can make like your 8-bit adders all work in parallel instead of having to work in sequence, right? So in that case, you would only have to worry about the gate delay for one of the adders if you use the, um, the, 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 the carry look ahead method instead of the gate delay for all of these uh, in series, right? Okay, so that, that was the adders. Um, so yeah, just a flavor of some of the circuits, the commutational circuits. Um, and then, yeah, and then I just want to kind of go quickly then through the sequential circuits. So I already mentioned, the, the one thing you should understand about um, these two um, kind of classes of circuits in these two separate sections is that for the sequential circuits, uh, these are stateful. So, um, they, um, the, the outputs are not just a simple function of the inputs. So they have some memory or some some state of um, what the past inputs were. Okay, so the outputs depend both on the inputs and what the, the history of the state that the circuit was in. Right. So the simplest of this is a flip flop, which um, can be used to store basically a single bit, right, in your basic. Um, basic types of flip-flops and, and um, it, it goes through a couple of different flip-flops uh, SR latch um, 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 D flip-flop and so on here uh, but they all perform kind of the same way notice here that then the reason why these can sort of have some state is because these are what I would kind of call recurrent circuits here so the outputs feed back to the inputs for these sequential circuits, okay? Uh, and then by doing so, so we're still using logical, logical gates, so, so a NOR gate here for the basic um, flip SR latch flip-flop that it um, shows here. But because the output feeds back to the input, um, you can get this behavior that you can get it so it can remember a bit. Um, and then from a control signal, uh, it can flip the bit. So you, so you can do a write operation to flip the bit from zero to one or, or vice versa. Um, So the um, I mean I'm kind of remembering the, um, the the so notice we call this the characteristic table now instead of the um, um, the, the the logic table right because basically it's possible that the next bit output um, can be some function of the current uh, bit output the, the current output here um, and that's what we're um, showing on the simplified uh, uh, characteristic table for the SR latch, right? So, um, 
basically for, for the SR control signals, if I, uh, I can't remember exactly, but um, 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 you know, when, when S and R are both zero, um, the, the output is going to be uh, whatever is stored in the flip-flop, basically. So, so this, is, this is what you need to have S and R set to if you want to just read the value out, or if you want to know what the current value stored in the flip-flop is. If you want to change the value to a zero, you, should, you need to set S to zero and R to one. So that, that will change it to zero. Um, And if, if you want to do a right, so these are the rights, right? If you, and if you want to write a one to flip flop, you need to set S to one, R to zero, right? And, and, and if you, um, And you know, if you think about that, if you start with S and R as zero, if you just activate one of these, uh, that will have the effect of writing. But but what this is saying is that it will stay at that value as long as as it's zero and one, and it will stay at this value as long as it's one and zero. If you go back to zero zero, then um, uh, whatever value it gets latched onto, it'll keep outputting that value, um, um, even though you've gone back to the um, to, to the read state of, of zero zero for the um, um, for the control signals here. Okay, so anyway, that, that's what the SR stands for for the SR latch, um, and, and it's really undefined for the SR latch what the behavior should be for if you get one one, um, and that's kind of a um, um, a drawback of the SR latch, and, and that leads to people designing these other latches like the D. Um, it's pretty easy to get around that because basically uh, for the SR latch, if, if you just uh, if, if you just input like like one signal and you just give it and the complement. Um, Um, you, can, you can do that with, with, with this, this variation called the clock as our flip-flop, which will only be able to update um, on the, the clock signal here, right? Um, but yeah, anyway, um, I'll probably kind of stop talking about the details here, let, let you um, 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 read them yourself. Um, so these are all variations on, on the same idea of, of, of this flip-flop. The D flip flop, the JK flip flop. Um, so JK is is nice because of the way it's designed. Um, you don't have that problem with the SR. Um, I mean, all, all possible inputs are um, defined. Um, so it has another nice property that um, um, you know when J and K are zero, that that's the the read. When J and K are one, you can use that to, to perform like a flip, a bit flip, right? So this has, actually has a use that, that uh, whatever the value currently is, you don't, don't have to know what the current value is. Uh, you know, so, so to use the JK to do a flip, you have to know what the current value is to explicitly set it to the other value. But for this one, um, you don't have to know. You can just say, OK, I just need to flip the bit now. Whatever the current value is, flip it to the other one. If I give the one one. Right? So again, th this can also be very useful um, inside of, of like a counter um, that we talk about in this um, section here, um, because as you're counting, basically the the all the bits that, that's representing a counter going from zero, one, two, three are, are basically just flipping back and forth at particular times. Um, all right, and then, yeah, I think I'm going to wrap up um, here. So then um, from, you know, those flip-flops, especially from that, that, uh, that idea of the, uh, the, the, the JK flip-flop, um, you know, we, we can look at, um, 
um, the use of these memory things. So, so any any place you need to store store a value to be manipulated, you need to use you know a flip flop, right? So not only RAM um, in your computer memory, but um, um, uh, on on the chip itself. So all the registers are really a place where you're storing some value. So those are all going to be using flip flops to to store the the register values that are being manipulated by the computer. Um, and um, and other things where you're you're storing. Um, like, like counters, where you're basically incrementing something. Counters are very important to uh, clocks, clock site. Well, no, that's not true. Uh, but, but yeah, counters are used in lots of places. Um, so. Okay, um, yeah, so, um, oh, uh, yeah, and there was the section on programmable, programmable logical devices. Um, um, like field programmable arrays and things. Um, I had a had a uh, submission from a student about um, a um, oh, lost my connection. Sorry about that. Um, about um, uh, a chip uh, design with which is. Trying to compete with NVIDIA for um, AI chips on eight on edge devices, but it sounded like they were using uh, something similar to an FPGA, if not basically FPGA. So, um, um, although uh, one 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 thing I will mention on this one final thing, so for the for um, the 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 basic idea of the programmable logic array. Is that it's really just a big grid of things in like some of product form, basically, right? So, so you have lots of things where, where you have inputs to ands, so that's the product that can then be ordered together to get the sum, right? So, like your sum of products. Um, and then, so the way that, that these work, both for the um, um, programmable logical array and the, the, the field programmable data array is that you can somehow either turn off or turn turn on the connections to, to implement um, an expression, uh, a sum of products expression, right? So for the first one, you actually have to do something that blows fuses uh, that defines these connections to, to implement your um, sum of products expression. For the, the field programmable uh, gate array, um, there's, a, there's um, a mechanism you can do the, to, to write those connections programmatically and, and then to redo those um, if you want to get a different hardwired circuit. So, so basically to program um, your sum of product expression. All right, so yeah, that's it. I'm, I'm, I basically lost my voice. Don't, don't think I can continue much more. Um, so yeah, that's for, it for the chapter. Has anybody then had some questions or um, wanted to go over any of the other assignment problems further maybe or anything? Um, no, I, I'll take that as everybody's good, maybe. Uh, I'm good. Okay. All right. So, um, yeah. So, um, I guess that's it for today. So, I'll stop there and see you guys um, at our next meeting. Room. See ya. See you next week. I got a question for you. Sure. Let me stop the recording.